Hello, and welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. How are you this week? I hope you're having a good one. If not, then I hope the next hour will provide a little escape for you. If you're feeling lonely or blue, just know that I appreciate you and the fact that you're here right now, listening to me talk. By pushing play on this show, you have changed someone's life for the good, and I think you deserve to know that. I wanted to thank some of you who have been tweeting about the show. Word of mouth is such a great way to help grow. I've never paid for advertising. The fact that we recently hit 1 million downloads is all because of people like you just taking time out of your day to do something so generous. Alex Dolowski, Coffee Colored Revolutionary, Ariel X, Gaz Porter, Nospo01, <laughs> I think that's how you say that, and so many more. Thank you as well to all of those who have taken the time to go rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. If you're new here, welcome, and please don't go to iTunes and complain about the fact that I'm speaking low or whispering. It's kind of the whole point of my podcast, hence the sleep part of the title. If you don't like my voice, that is totally fair, and you can just turn it off and we can all go on with our lives, or at least leave something constructive. I know this show isn't everyone's cup of tea. It's like a subgenre of a subgenre. And I have to say, my reviews have been great for the most part, and my bad ones are nowhere near as vicious as some of them I see on other podcasts, and I'm so grateful for that. Now, on with tonight's episode. My brother Ethan gave me the idea for this episode. He lives in Oregon, and the last time I visited him, he took me to a very creepy lighthouse. Since then, he has told me so many stories about the lighthouses that silently stand guard along the coast of Oregon. I love a good lighthouse ghost tale. They are inherently scary places on their own, sort of like abandoned hospitals or old creaky houses. The only difference is... Even in their heyday, lighthouses were pretty lonely in bleak places, and a lot of times filled with tragic tales. Lighthouse keepers had a job that meant life or death for countless sailors, and in the time before electricity, it meant a nocturnal existence of keeping watch over a life-saving flame. They lived their lives among the dampness of sea spray and the chill of gray skies. Tonight, I am going to tell you a few of their true stories, with a sprinkling of legend, and one that is a fictional story about a real lighthouse that has been mistakenly told as a true story for years. The first story is the aforementioned fictional one. It's the story that my brother recently sent me. Attached to the copy he sent was an editor's note by Finn John of OffBeatOregon.com. Finn noted that the story was published in 1899 as fiction in a West Coast literary magazine called Pacific Monthly, and that the author, Leeson Miller, never represented her story as anything other than fiction. However, many people got the idea that the story was true and it's been passed down since as a true ghost tale. This is The Haunted Light at Newport by the Sea. Situated at Yakina on the coast of Oregon is an old deserted lighthouse. It stands upon a promontory that juts out, dividing the bay from the ocean and is exposed to every wind that blows. Its weather-beaten walls are wrapped in mystery. Of an afternoon when the fog comes drifting in from the sea and completely envelops the lighthouse and then stops in its course as if its object had been attained. It is the loneliest place in the world. At such times, those who chance to be in the vicinity hear a moaning sound like the cry of one in pain 
and sometimes a frenzied call for help pierces the death-like stillness of the waning day. Far out at sea, ships passing in the night are often guided in their course by a light that gleams from the lantern tower where no lamp is ever trimmed. In the days when Newport was but a handful of cabins, roughly built and flanked by an Indian camp, across the bar there sailed a sloop, grotesquely rigged and without a name. The arrival of a vessel was a rare event, and by the time the stranger had dropped anchor abreast the village, the whole population were gathered on the strip of sandy beach to welcome her. She was manned by a swarthy crew, and her skipper was a beetle-browed ruffian with a scar across his cheek from mouth to ear. A boat was lowered, and in it, a man about forty years of age, accompanied by a young girl, were rowed ashore. The man was tall and dark, and his manner and speech indicated gentle breeding. He explained that the sloop's water casks were empty, and was directed to the spring that poured down the face of the yellow sandstone cliff a few yards up the beach. Issuing instructions in some heathenish, unfamiliar tongue to the boatman, he devoted himself to asking and answering questions. The sloop was bound down the coast to Coos Bay. She had encountered rough weather off the Columbia River bar and had been driven far out of her course. To the young lady, his daughter, the voyage proved most trying. She was not a good sailor. If, therefore, accommodations could be secured, he wished to leave her ashore until the return of the sloop, a fortnight later. The landlady of the, name has been redacted, had a room to spare, and by the time the water casks were filled, arrangements had been completed, which resulted in the transfer of the fair traveler's luggage from the sloop to the hotel. The father bade his daughter an affectionate adieu and was rowed back to the vessel, which at once weighed anchor and sailed away in the golden dusk of the summer evening. Muriel was the name she gave. Muriel Trevenard was a delicate-looking, fair-haired girl, still in her teens, very sweet and sunny-tempered. She seemed to take kindly to her new environment, accepting its rude inconveniences as a matter of course, though all her own belongings testified to the fact that she was accustomed to the refinements and even luxuries of civilization. She spent many hours each day idling with a sketch block and a pencil in that grassy hollow in the hill, seaward from the town, or strolled upon the beach or over the windswept uplands. The fortnight lengthened to a month, and yet no sign of the sloop or any sail rose above the horizon to southward. You've no cause to worry, said the landlady. Your father's safe enough. No rough weather since he sailed, and as for time, a ship's time is as uncertain as a woman's temper, I've heard my own father say. Oh, I'm not anxious, replied Muriel. Not in the least. It was in August that a party of pleasure seekers came over the coast range and pitched their tents in the grassy hollow. They were a merry company, and they were not long in discovering Muriel. Such a pretty girl, exclaimed Cora May, who was herself so fair that she could afford to be generous. I am sure she does not belong to anybody out here. We must coax her to come to our camp. But the girl needed little coaxing. She found these light-hearted young people a pleasant interruption, and she was enthusiastically welcomed by all, young and old alike. She joined them in their ceaseless excursions and made one of the group that gathered nightly around the campfire. There was one, a rather serious-minded youth, who speedily constituted himself her cavalier. He was always at hand to help her into the boat, to bait her hook when they went fishing, and to carry her shawl, or book, or sketch block, and she accepted these attentions, as she seemed to accept all else, naturally and sweetly. The Cape Foul Weather Light had just been completed, and the house upon the bluff above Newport was deserted. 
Some member of the camping party proposed one Sunday afternoon that they pay it a visit. We have seen everything else there is to see, remarked Cora May. It is just an ordinary house with a lantern on top, objected Muriel. You can get a good view of it from the bay. Besides, it is probably locked up. Somebody has the key. We can soon find out who, said Harold Welch. And we haven't anything else to do. Accordingly, they set out in a body to find the key. It was in the possession of the landlady's husband, who had been appointed to look after the premises. He said he had not been up there lately and seemed surprised after a mild fashion that anyone should feel an interest in an empty house, but he directed them how to reach it. You go up the trail to the top of the hill and you'll strike the road, but you won't find anything worth seeing after you get there. It ain't anywhere like the new light. With much merry talk and laughter, they climbed the hill and found the road. A smooth and narrow avenue overshadowed by dark young pines, winding along the hilltop to the rear of the house. It stood in a small enclosure, bare of vegetation. The sand was piled in little wind-swept heaps against the board fence. There was a walk paved with brick, leading from the gate around to the front, where two or three steps went up to the square porch with seats on either side. Harold Welch unlocked the door, and they went into the empty hall that echoed dismally to the sound of human voices. Rooms opened from the hallway on either hand, and in the L at the back were the kitchen, storerooms, and pantry, a door that gave egress to a narrow veranda and another shutting off the cellar. At the rear of the hall, the stairs led up to the second floor, which was divided like the first into plain square rooms. But the stairway went on, winding up to a small landing where a window looked out to the northward and from which a little room, evidently a linen closet, opened opposite the window. There was nothing extraordinary about this closet at the first glance. It was well furnished with shelves and drawers and its only unoccupied wall space was finished with a simple wainscoting. Why, cried one as they crowded the landing and overflowed into the closet, this house seems to be falling to pieces. He pulled at a section of the wainscoting, and it came away in his hand. Hello. What's this? Iron walls. It's hollow, said another, tapping the smooth surface disclosed by the removal of the panel. So it is, cried the first speaker. I wonder what's behind it. Why, it opens. It was a heavy piece of sheet iron, about three feet square. He moved it to one side, set it against the wall, and peered into the aperture. How mysterious, exclaimed Muriel, leaning forward to look into the dark closet whose height and depth exactly corresponded to the dimensions of the panel. It went straight back some six or eight feet and then dropped abruptly into what seemed a soundless well. One, more curious than the rest, crawled in and threw down lighted bits of paper. It goes to the bottom of the sea, he declared as he backed out and brushed the dust from his clothes. Who knows what it is or why it was built? Smugglers, suggested somebody, and they all laughed, though there was nothing particularly humorous in the remark, but they were strangely nervous and excited. There was something uncanny in the atmosphere of this deserted dwelling that oppressed them with an unaccountable sense of dread. They hurried out leaving the dark closet open, and climbed up into the lantern tower where no lamp had been lighted these many years. The afternoon, which had been flooded with sunshine, was waning in a mist that swept in from the sea and muffled the world in dull gray. Let us go home, cried Cora May. If it were clear, we might see almost to China from this tower, but the fog makes me lonesome. So they clambered down the iron ladder, and descending 
the stairs passed out through the lower hall into the gray fog. Harold Welch stopped to lock the door, and Muriel waited for him at the foot of the steps. The lock was rusty, and he had trouble with the key. By the time he joined her, the rest of the party had disappeared around the house. You were kind to wait for me, he said, as they caught step on the brick pavement and moved forward. But Muriel laid her hand upon his arm. I, I must go back, she said. I, I dropped my handkerchief in the hall upstairs. I must go back and get it. They remounted the steps, and Welch unlocked the door and let her pass in. But when he would have followed, she stopped him imperiously. I am going alone, she said. You are not to wait. Lock the door and go. I will come out through the kitchen. He objected, but she was obstinate, and perhaps because her lightest wish was beginning to be his law of life, he reluctantly obeyed her. Again, the key hung in the lock. This time it took him several minutes to release it. When he reached the rear of the house, Muriel was nowhere to be seen. He called her two or three times and waited, but receiving no reply, concluded that she had hurried out and joined the rest whose voices came back to him from the avenue of pines. She had been nervous and irritable all afternoon, so unlike herself, that he had wondered more than once if she were ill or weary of his close attendance. It occurred to him now that possibly she had taken this means to rid herself of his company. He hurried on, for it was growing cold and the fog was thickening to a rain. He had just caught up with the stragglers of the party, and they were beginning to chafe him at being alone when the somber stillness of the darkening day was rent by a shriek so wild and weird that they who heard it felt blood freeze suddenly in their veins. They shrank involuntarily closer and looked at each other with blanched cheeks and startled eyes. Before anyone found voice, it came again. This time it was a cry for help, thrice repeated in quick succession. Muriel! Where is Muriel? demanded Welch, his heart leaping in sudden fear. Why, you ought to know, cried Coramay. We left her with you. They hurried toward the deserted house. She went back to get her handkerchief, exclaimed Welch. She told me not to wait, and I locked the door and came on. Locked her? In that horrid place? Why did you do it? exclaimed Cora indignantly. She said she would come out by way of the kitchen, replied he. She could not. The door is locked and the key is broken off in the lock, said another. I noticed it when we were rummaging around in there. They began to call encouragingly. Muriel, Muriel we are coming. coming. Don't, Don't be afraid. Be afraid but they got no reply. Oh, let us hurry, urged Cora. Perhaps she fainted with fright. In a very few minutes, they were pouring into the house and looking and calling through the lower rooms, then upstairs, and there, upon the floor in the upper chamber, where the gray light came in through the curtainless windows, they found a pool of warm, red blood. There were blood drops in the hall and on the stairs that led up to the landing, and in the linen closet they picked up a blood-stained handkerchief, but there was nothing else. The iron door had been replaced, and the panel in the wainscoting was closed, and try as they might, they could not open it. They were confronted by an apparent tragedy, appalled by a fearful mystery, and they could do
do nothing. Nothing. They returned to the village and gave the alarm, and, reinforced, came back and renewed the hopeless search with lanterns. They ransacked the house again and again, from tower to cellar. They scoured the hills in vain delusion that she might have escaped from the house and wandered off in the fog. But they found nothing, nor ever did, save the blood drops on the stairs and a little handkerchief. It will be a dreadful blow to her father, remarked the landlady. I don't want to be the one to break it to him. And she had her wish. For the sloop, nor any of its crew, ever again sailed into Yakina Bay. As time went by, the story was forgotten by all but those who joined in that weary search for the missing girl. But to this day, it is said... The bloodstains are dark upon the floor in that upper chamber. And one there who carried the little handkerchief next to his heart till the hour of his own tragic death. You know what isn't as mysterious as a woman disappearing, leaving only drops of blood behind? building a website, at least not with Wix. Wix makes everything so easy. It's seriously designed for people like me who are incredibly tech illiterate, as well as people who know exactly what they're doing. With Wix code for serverless, hassle-free coding, you can even add voice recognition capabilities. Get hundreds of design features and apps to grow your brand online. Video backgrounds, galleries, menus, forms, lists, you name it, Wix has it. I get a lot of emails from my listeners about what they need to do when they start their own podcast. And let me tell you, you need a website to represent your brand and Wix has you covered. It's got an easy to use website builder that uses drag and drop, which even I can do. Got merch? You can use Wix to take online payments, set up multiple payment options and instantly connect with your customers. With Wix, you'll look like an old pro from day one. And since I want nothing but the best for my listeners, I want you to have 10% off. Just go to wix.com slash podcast. That's wix.com slash podcast for 10% off. And feel free to send me a link to your new website when you're done. For the rest of this episode... The stories get truer and scarier. Even though poor Muriel was just a bit of fiction, the rest of these poor souls were not. So, listen to some soothing sounds of the sea while I tell you all about some of the world's most haunted lighthouses and how they came to be so spirited. The first lighthouse we're going to discuss is the Smalls Lighthouse. The current version of this lighthouse sits on a rock about 25 miles off the coast of Wales. If you look up pictures of this lighthouse that is there today, you would probably not agree to live there even for a million dollars. It's the typical tall and narrow cylindrical shape that you're all familiar with, and it's stuck onto a sea-swept rock. It looks terrifying. Now, this story isn't about that lighthouse. It's about the one that sat in the same spot before it. And if you think living in a narrow tube while Poseidon hurls all his might at you is scary, then imagine that, except there is no base. It's a small, circular oak structure that teeters on tall oakwood struts, which are just skinny little legs. Later, they added a center column for more, quote-unquote, stability. The structure was accessed by getting out of a rickety little boat, hoping you don't slip on the rocks and die while you walk over to a rope ladder that you then climb up to a trap door, all while being hit with sea spray, and since it's whales, you're probably freezing and it's probably raining. Oh, and you also have to get all of your supplies up there somehow. I think it was a rope and pulley system. Lots of upper body strength training, which was nice. The very first incident happened right away, when the designer, 
Henry Whiteside decided to visit the structure. He was stranded there for a month and was short on supplies, and he wrote several letters. Here they are. To Mr. Williams, Smalls, February 1st, 1777. Sir, being now in a most dangerous and distressed condition upon the Smalls, do hereby trust Providence will bring to your hand this which prayeth for your immediate assistance to fetch us off the Smalls before the next spring, or we fear we shall all perish. Our water near all gone, our fire quite gone, and our house in a most melancholy manner. I doubt not, but you will fetch us from here as fast as possible, and we can be got off at some part of the tide almost any weather. I need say no more, but remain your distressed, humble servant, Mr. Whiteside. We were distressed in a gale of wind upon the 13th of January, since which we have not been able to keep any light, but we could not have any light above sixteen nights longer for want of oil and candles, which makes us murmur and think we are forgotten. We doubt not, but that whoever takes up this will be so merciful as to cause it to be sent to Thomas Williams, Esquire, Trelithen near St. David's, Wales. If you're wondering how Mr. Whiteside got these letters to his intended, he actually put them in bottles and threw them into the sea, where they successfully reached Thomas Williams and they were rescued. Listeners, this was the first visit to the lighthouse. Whiteside wasn't even a lighthouse keeper. He was just visiting a building he had designed before it became the residence to whoever was going to become the keeper. Where the story gets incredibly grim is in 1801, when two men, by the names of Thomas Howell and Thomas Griffith, were hired on at the Smalls Lighthouse. According to old sources, the men did not get along and argued constantly even before they left for the lighthouse. Reports say that at some point, Griffith became unwell. Now, I will say, I read a few different articles and things about this incident. Most of them say Griffith became unwell. However, I did see a couple of times where the author said Griffith died in a freak accident. I don't know which is true. Obviously, saying he died in a freak accident, especially when put into quotes, makes for a more sensational story but I can't say for sure what his cause of death really was. Not that I was calling whales and asking them to dig into their archives. So if you have a better, more official idea of what happened, please let me know, I'm curious. So Griffith passes away somehow. Howell immediately sends out a distress signal to passing ships, but it was to no avail. Weeks began to pass and since the light continued to shine, It's believed that the passing ships assumed there was no issue, since obviously someone was up there, keeping the lantern going. Despite the cold, Griffith's body began to decompose, and Howell had to just exist alongside it. It's at this point most people would have said a few kind words and tossed old Griffey over the railing into the sea, but... Howell was very aware that he and Griffith had a reputation for arguing. He was terrified that when supplies or help did arrive, they would see that Griffith was gone and would charge him with murder, and if there was no body to prove otherwise, then he would surely hang for the murder of his peer. So Howell, unable to stand the stench of death and decay, and having been a cooper in another life, ripped boards off a bulkhead within their dwelling apartments and built a makeshift coffin, placing the decomposing Griffith inside. He then took the coffin outside and tied it to the railings of the lighthouse, where he hoped he could store the body until help arrived. Howell was not what you would call a lucky man, for a huge storm set in soon after. 
The winds and the waves were biblical. They tore the coffin to shreds, leaving the emaciated corpse of Thomas Griffith swinging off the railings, still tangled in the ropes that had once secured his own casket. Howell said that when the wind would rock the body, Griffith's arm would wave as if it was greeting or beckoning Howell. Thomas Howell was stuck, staring at the waving corpse for four more months, with several ships attempting to make contact to no avail, according to some of the ships that tried to contact them. They would get close to the shore and see the figure of a man, backlit by the lighthouse lantern, waving to them. After months and months of keeping to his duties, all the while, his dead co-worker waved away their rescue boats. Howell was still keeping the lantern lit. When rescue did come, he was completely mad and physically unrecognizable to those who knew him. According to some sources, his hair had turned snow white. Because of this horror tale come true, there were changes made to the way lighthouses were manned in the UK. It was policy that no less then three men at a time were to be stationed in each lighthouse to prevent an incident like this from occurring in the future. Poor Thomas Howell. Imagine sitting with only your thoughts to keep you company as this rickety lighthouse sways in the wind, the sea threatening to claim it, all the while, just outside the window, you can see a corpse beckoning you to join it in death. And let's just take a quick break and I'm going to talk to you about Lola. Lola is a female founded company offering a line of organic cotton tampons, pads, liners, and all natural cleansing wipes. It's a company that is by women for women. And I'm so excited to talk to you guys about it. So I don't know if you know this, but the FDA doesn't require brands to disclose a comprehensive list of ingredients in their feminine care products. So most of them don't. Have you ever taken the time to look at the box of your tampons and looked for ingredients? I guarantee you they are probably not there. Lola offers complete transparency about the ingredients found in their tampons, pads, liners, and wipes. Major brands use a mix of synthetic ingredients in their products, including rayon and polyester, which is kind of gross. Their feminine care products may also be treated with harsh chemical cleansing agents, fragrances, and dyes, and we all know those are not good for your lady parts. Lola products are 100% organic cotton with no added chemicals, fragrances, synthetics, or dyes. And one thing I personally love about the Lola brand is with every purchase, they donate feminine care products to homeless shelters across the U.S. There are so many women in this world who can't afford feminine care products, and they deserve really good products too, including the 100% cotton with no added chemicals. When I received my Lola box, it was I was so surprised. It The box was so small and discreet. It was just a cardboard box. It looked like something maybe from Amazon. And when you open it up, the packaging is just, even the packaging itself for the tampons were very nice. It's just a white box. And the tampons themselves were really, they're small. They're easy to fit into like a clutch bag or, you know, kind of in the palm of your hand. And they're great products. And like they said, the ingredients were on the box. That's just something I've never even thought to look for before. And now I'm definitely a, a Lola fan for life, seriously. And for 40% off of all subscriptions, visit mylola.com and enter sleep when you subscribe. That's right. I want you guys to take part in this amazing company. So for 40% off all subscriptions, visit mylola.com and enter sleep when you subscribe. We begin our next story in Scotland, in the Flannan Islands, on the Isle of Ellen Moore. I emailed a friend in Scotland about the pronunciation, so I hope I did okay. 
What I didn't think to do was ask her about all the other names that came up later in the story, and I don't want to pester her, so I googled to the best of my ability. Just a note, too. Recently, I've come across a lot of traditional Irish and Scottish names and places, and I cannot for the life of me find any sort of pronunciation guide for some of them. So if you ever hear me butchering something really bad, it isn't because I don't care, I promise. And feel free to tweet or email me the correct pronunciation. In our last story, we learned about how, after the incident at the Smalls Lighthouse, a policy was put into place that three men would man a lighthouse at all times. It's a system that worked beautifully, and at Ellen Moore, they actually had four men, but they would all take turns taking two weeks off at a time. So there was always one man on the mainland, while three worked in the lighthouse. Every two weeks, a ship would come to bring supplies and to switch out the fourth man with whoever's turn it was to take their time off. On December 15, 1900, a steamer ship called the Arctur passed by the lighthouse and noted in its logbook that the light was not operational despite its need in such poor weather conditions. The ship docked on the 18th in Leith and passed on the note to the Northern Lighthouse Board. There was a relief vessel called the Hesperus scheduled to go out to the island on December 20th to check up on the workers. However, the weather only worsened and they weren't able to sail to the island until noon on December 26th. The ship was headed by Captain James Harvey and had on board the relief man for one of the lighthouse workers, Joseph Moore. As they arrived, they noticed the dock was empty. No relief flag was in the flagstaff. None of the men were waiting to welcome them, and there weren't even any empty provision boxes waiting to be restocked. Finding it curious, they blew the ship's horn and sent up a flare in hopes to make contact with the men. They waited, listening for a response. But there was no answer. Both Moore and Captain Harvey admitted to feeling a sense of dread as they approached the island. Despite this feeling, Moore volunteered to disembark and investigate further. He was going to be staying there anyway to relieve one of the men. He walked up the steps to the house and found the door unlocked. There was no trace of the three men. Thomas Marshall, James Ducat, or Donald MacArthur. The clocks on the wall had all stopped. The beds were unmade. The fireplace had seemingly not been lit in a few days. But only two of the three keepers' oilskin coats were missing, which was surprising considering the severity of the weather on the date of the last entry of the lighthouse log. The only thing Moore found disturbed was an overturned chair by the dining table. He searched the immediate area before returning back to the ship informing the captain that the men were nowhere to be found. Captain Harvey told Moore to stay, and three seamen volunteered to stay as well to help Moore run the lighthouse for the time being. Captain Harvey sent a telegram to the Northern Lighthouse Board, dated December 26, 1900, stating, A dreadful accident has happened at the Flannans. The three keepers, Ducat, Marshall, and the occasional have disappeared from the island. The clocks were stopped, and other signs that indicated that the accident must have happened about a week ago. Poor fellows, they must have been blown over the cliffs or drowned trying to secure a crane. It seems Captain Harvey thought the case was tragic, but pretty open and shut. Just an unfortunate consequence to having a dangerous job. An investigation was launched they never found any signs of the men, but they did find one part of the island so damaged that it has actually caused people to think that something otherworldly attacked the keepers. A box at 33 meters or 108 feet above sea level had been broken and its contents strewn about. Iron railings were bent over the iron railway by the path was wretched out of its concrete, and a rock weighing more than a ton had been displaced. On top of the cliff, at more than 60 meters, 
or 200 feet above sea level. Turf had been ripped away as far as 10 meters from the cliff edge. The missing keepers had kept their log until 9 a.m. on December 15th. The entries made it clear that the damage had occurred before their disappearance, so it couldn't have been the cause of it. Before we get into the theories surrounding the disappearance, I need to take you back a few hundred years. What I hadn't mentioned yet is that Ellen Moore, long before there was a lighthouse present, was thought to be a cursed island. The Flannan Islands actually have an old Scottish Gaelic name that translates to the Seven Hunters. Oh, you thought I was going to try to say it, didn't you? Not a chance. (laughs) I respect the language way too much, but feel free to look it up. And I actually found a few YouTube videos of people talking about the Isles in Gaelic that are really fascinating. Anyway, they take their name from the 7th century Irish preacher and later saint, Saint Flannan, who once inhabited the island called Ellen Moor, meaning Big Isle. Saint Flannan built a Celtic church on the island and had a congregation. However, the church quickly declined and it was abandoned, leaving the isle uninhabited. Or was it? The isles have always been thought to be a magical place. The only other humans who visited the island were sheep farmers. They claimed the land was very much inhabited, but not by humans. By magical creatures such as elves, spirits, fairy folk, even some kind of large bird creatures. One of the theories, in fact, was that all of the men were kidnapped and taken to the land of the fairies. If you've ever met someone who is into fairies and fairy worlds, they will tell you fairies are not the adorable little tinkerbells we think of. Look up the case of Bridget Cleary when you get the chance. Even if you don't believe in fairies, those who do have actually tortured and murdered people because of their belief in them in the past. The severe damage to the island made some people think it was a sea serpent or perhaps even Nessie herself who attacked the island. Some think they were captured by pirates. Some even like to add on to that that they were ghost pirates. In present day, we are much more learned than our naive ancestors, so the prevailing paranormal theory today is simply aliens. Look, we can all agree it is a little less open and shut than Captain Harvey made it seem especially with the added knowledge that the severe damage happened before the men disappeared. In fact, there's even a Doctor Who episode about it. Just to be fair, I will read to you the official conclusion, and you can make up your own mind about what happened. On December 29th, 1900, Robert Muirhead, a Northern Lighthouse Board superintendent, arrived to conduct the official investigation into the incident. He examined the clothing left behind in the lighthouse and concluded that James Ticott and Thomas Marshall had gone down to the western landing stage and that Donald MacArthur, also known as the Occasional, had left the lighthouse during heavy rain in his shirt sleeves. He noted that whoever left the light last and unattended was in breach of NLB rules. He also noted that some of the damage at the west landing was Difficult to believe unless actually seen. And this is exactly what he said. From evidence which I was able to procure, I was satisfied that the men had been on duty up till dinner time on Saturday the 15th of December. That they had gone down to secure a box in which the mooring ropes, landing ropes, etc. were kept, and which was secured in a crevice in the rock about 110 feet above sea level and that an extra-large sea had rushed up the face of the rock, had gone above them, and coming down with immense force, had swept them completely away. Personally, my favorite theory is that allegedly there was seen a long boat full of ghosts headed to the island the night that the light went out. However, some people think that maybe it was them trying to escape the island, and they weren't ghosts at all, and they were just lost at sea since they were in a longboat 
in the midst of a very bad storm. One last thing to conclude the Ellen Moore mystery. I went down a teensy rabbit hole of sorts. Remember the first ship that realized that the light in the lighthouse was out and informed the lighthouse board, the Arctur? Well, like the three lighthouse keepers, it too mysteriously disappeared. It was last seen sailing away on January 2nd, 1912 from Norfolk, Virginia. 24 souls were on board and it was never heard from again. From Scotland, the country, to Scotland, Maryland, now let's go to the lighthouse with the most disturbing past, Point Lookout. The two previous stories have been tragic, but from what we can gather, all just unfortunate incidents. Point Lookout was witness to very purposeful tragedy. For starters, like many modern American landmarks, it was built upon the land of indigenous people, namely the Yaucomico tribe. Spanish settlers arrived in 1500, and in 1612, John Smith himself actually landed there. The Yaucomico were an Algonquin-speaking tribe who were cruelly wiped out. By the later part of the 17th century, not long after the non-Disney version of John Smith and his crew arrived, the Yaucomico disappeared from historical record because along with Christianity they forced upon the natives, Europeans also brought a whole lot of infectious diseases. Fast forward a couple hundred years and a revolutionary war and we come to the year 1830, where a guy named John Donahue built a lighthouse. A lighthouse that is considered now to be the most haunted in America. After the Battle of Gettysburg during the Civil War, the Union Army built a prisoner of war camp just north of the lighthouse. It was in operation from August 1863 until June 1865 and was the largest Union prison camp for Confederate soldiers. The lighthouse sat a few feet away from the prison's hospital. According to Dolores Monet of Exemplar.com, Prisoners were held in an open-air camp in tattered canvas tents, hot and mosquito-infested in the summer, freezing cold in winter. Conditions were crowded and dirty, and there were reports of contaminated water and spoiled food. It is estimated that between 3,000 to 8,000 men died of war wounds and disease and were buried in a mass grave. One of the ghosts that people see around the lighthouse is a Civil War soldier. When you see him, he is shambling up the road in tattered clothes. People even say he smells like mildew and gunpowder. Witnesses say it looks like he is trying to escape the prison camp, but obviously never succeeded. The lighthouse itself was a stop on the Underground Railroad during the Civil War. During that time, the keeper of the lighthouse was actually a woman named Pamelia Edwards. Allegedly, she was forced by the Union to turn the lighthouse from a stop on the Underground Railroad to a place to keep female prisoners on their way to a federal prison. Pamelia immediately regretted allowing them inside, however, because she soon became witness to many tortures and deaths of the women by the soldiers. She began helping the prisoners escape, but was removed from her post in 1869. Before Pamelia and before, and before the lighthouse became a sinister place, the first keeper, James Davis, died in the lighthouse only after three months of service. His daughter, Anne, then operated the lighthouse until her death in 1847. Sadly, she was a well-liked woman who was known to fantasize about leaving the lighthouse, but never did. She wanted to travel and she is one of the supposed ghosts that you can see. You can see her standing at the top of a stairway, wearing a white blouse and a long blue skirt, with a sad look on her face. Other figures have been seen in the basement, doors mysteriously open and closed with strange noises, snoring, ghostly voices, and footsteps. Voices have even been heard coming out of nowhere. Fire if they get too close to you, and... 
let us not take objection to what they are doing, are some phrases that people have heard whispered in their ears while at Point Lookout. One person even claimed to hear a soft female voice saying, this is my house. One very spooky, spooky picture I found, and I will put it on the Instagram page because it is really creepy. Um, a woman named Laura Bird, who was an employee of the state of Maryland, she lived at the lighthouse in the 1970s, and she had a few weird things happen to her. The weirdest was, in a photograph, Laura's standing there, and it looks like she's holding a candle, but just to the side of her, kind of behind and to the left of her, is what looks to be a Civil War soldier. It almost looks like he was kind of ducking away from the camera to not be in the shot. And she also heard ghostly voices calling her name. One night she even said that she was awoken to a strange configuration of lights dancing above her bed. Then she smelled smoke and ran downstairs and found that her space heater had caught fire. And she swears to this day that a spirit or angel or something saved her life. And quickly, these are a few shipwrecks and murders that happened right outside of the lighthouse on ships. And these are other possible ghosts around there. The first one was the Ark and the Dove were two ships that brought the first European settlers under Leonard Calvert to Maryland. One of the passengers, Thomas Allen, was reported as shot and killed at Point Lookout. In July of 1864, the USS Tulip exploded off the coast of Point Lookout. Despite problems with a damaged boiler, Captain William Smith gave the order to increase steam pressure. The boiler blew up, causing the subsequent sinking of the ship. Forty-seven souls were lost that day. Ten lived, though two later died of injuries incurred at the time of the explosion and shipwreck. Eight mangled corpses washed up on the shore of Point Lookout. And in 1878, a hurricane known as the Gale of 78 ripped the salon deck off a cargo and passenger ship named the Express. Waves rolled the ship just north of the Point Lookout, and 16 people were lost. The second mate, Joseph, or James, Heaney, has knocked at the door of the lighthouse during storms. He sometimes appears on the beach in a sodden uniform before major storms. That's kind of nice. He just kind of Let's you know, hey, just FYI, storms are coming. <laughs> we are going to end off the night with something a little short, but no less frightening. Seguin Island is home to the second oldest lighthouse in Maine. As we've talked about time and time again, most lighthouses are pretty isolated places, especially the ones located on islands. Which is exactly why the lighthouse keeper's wife, in the mid-1800s, fell into a deep depression. The isolation and the boredom, mixed with the constant gloomy weather, was a toxic cocktail of misery. In an attempt to cheer up his wife, the lighthouse keeper ordered a piano from the mainland. It worked. The woman found a song she really enjoyed from the songbook that was sent along with piano, and practice every day, all day, the same song for months. Her husband suggested she try a different song from the book and she declined. He was soon begging his wife to play a different song. She still refused, tapping away at the keys to that same tune. In a rage, the lighthouse keeper grabbed an axe and chopped the piano to pieces. But he didn't stop there. He butchered his wife right then and there with the same axe. When he snapped out of his rage and saw what he had done, he took his own life. Visitors say they still hear faint piano music drifting throughout the house. 
In 1985, the lighthouse was decommissioned and a warrant officer was sent to pack up the remaining furniture. Not wanting to make the trip back in the dark, he decided to spend the night in the lighthouse and return in the morning. He was awoken by a man standing over him, wearing oil skins, rapidly shaking his head and saying, Don't take the furniture. Please leave my home alone. Before vanishing... The warrant officer actually just shook off the encounter as a dream and went back to sleep. He spent the next day packing up the furniture and loading it into a boat, ignoring the ghost's plea. While lowering the boat into the water, the entire thing sank, and all the antique goods and furniture were lost to the sea. Thanks for listening. I hope this week's episode was relaxing yet chilling. Special thanks to this week's Patreon subscribers. My eternal gratitude to Sid Sennett and Wanden. You guys are amazing and I should have another bonus app up soon. Sorry for the delay after last week's falling through. Please send me your stories. I want to hear them all. True, not true, weird, gross. Just send them to me. Scare you to sleep at gmail.com. Also, I had a weird issue with my P.O. box a couple months ago, and I had to change the address, and I can't remember if I ever updated it on the show, so if you've just been staring at that jar of human teeth to send me, then send them to Shelby Scott, P.O. Box 8224, Mission Hills, California, 91346. And no stalkers, I don't actually live in Mission Hills. Nice try follow the show on twitter and instagram at scare you to sleep you can follow my personal stuff at shelby b scott join the facebook group facebook.com slash scare you to sleep to talk about all the episodes or just to post creepy shit that you think the community and i would love for real though send me scary videos i can't get enough of them and i think that's all folks now go get some sleep sweet dreams Do you love horror and weird fiction? Enter Meltopia, a new world of horror fiction. A podcast featuring interconnecting short stories, series, and web serials, all taking place in a single horror universe. Listen to the Shepherd of Wolves series, where a killer who blurs the line between art and death is lured into a dark and mysterious killing game. Discover the Lost Library series, an exploration of Maltopia's many first-person accounts of bizarre, disturbing, and sometimes violent events and characters. And listen in on The Weird Book Show, an in-world podcast where the hosts examine the fallout from the great darkness of 1999 and the many events, artifacts, and conspiracies that have led to modern-day Maltopia. A growing world of mystery, monsters, and madness, with a deep mythology that webs its way across multiple dark fiction series and web serials. Maltopia provides the horror lover in you an incredibly immersive experience that's sure to reach the top of your playlist. Just search for Maltopia, a new world of horror fiction, on your favorite podcast provider. That's Maltopia, M-A-E-L-T-O-P-I-A, a new world of horror. Don the shadows of Maltopia and listen as the night becomes the world. Are you intrigued by all things that go bump in the night? Do you wonder what makes serial killers tick? Do you want to be spooked shitless? I'm Kayla. And I'm Michaela. And we are Tale of Two Dead Girls. If you want to dig into the world of everything true crime, paranormal, and all things spooky, then we are the podcast for you. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. We'll We'll meet meet you six feet feet under. under.